Um, okay, let's all stand for the pledge, please. Which flag would you like us? Uh, oh, this one. Yeah, this one. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. President Daly? Here. Vice President Headland? Here. Trustee Clements? Here. Trustee McNall? Here. Trustee Parr? Here. Thank you for joining us. Um, the next meeting of the Haldane Board of Education scheduled for next uh, Tuesday, December 3rd, 7 p.m., right here in the high school room 211. And I'd like to remind the public and the board that we have our joint retreat this coming Saturday. Um, that retreat is with the garrison school board and we'll be, um, we've invited NISBA to come and we'll be working on uh, learning a board self-evaluation tool. So that was something that both our school board and the Garrison School Board were interested in doing. So we've joined forces to uh, do it together. Uh, so we'll be at Winter Hill on Saturday at 10 o'clock, 10 to 2. It'll be lunch, 10 to 2, yeah. Um, thanks. And thanks to Julia Familaro for helping to coordinate that retreat. I'll turn it over to Dr. Bernard. Thank you, Ms. Daly, and welcome to the members of the community that are with us this evening. We have two guests who I look forward to introducing in a few minutes. Uh, I'd like to start by providing the board with an update about where we are in the strategic coherence planning process. So I do have some slides that I'm going to refer to uh, over the majority of the board's shoulders collectively mm -hmm. here. So, uh, and I'm going to come into and out of this presentation and bear with me as we're working with a new setup here. So I hope not to do this. Yep, Martin, sure. No problem. Yep, that makes sense. So first, uh, this is a, a slide or a note I had shared with our staff last school year. I know our parents as well, perhaps the board, perhaps not. And uh, upon entry and uh, conducting many entry interviews with members of our community, both internal uh, and external, this was a, a theme that emerged. Our community is incredibly proud of our school system and should be. We have an excellent school system in many ways. However, there was a feeling that arose uh, or, or a theme that emerged uh, when exploring the feelings of many of our community members that with continued shifts in administration at the district and the building level, as well as many new families that were moving into our area in recent years. We lacked a core identity and or a coherent vision for our district. I heard a lot, where are we going uh, as a school community? So I'll start there. And this is another slide, it's a tweet actually from Ted Dintersmith that I like to share with folks. Uh, Ted Dintersmith is um, a writer, he's also an entrepreneur, um, and he writes often about uh, what uh, schools could be, uh, the current, the traditional design of schools, as well as the potential for what schools can become. And he wrote, a, a student at last night's amazing community forum in Molokai uh, stated, I've spent four years getting good grades, prepping for standardized tests, and developing a great college resume, yet I have no idea who I am, what my values are, or who I want to become. Something is wrong. Kind of strikes at the core of uh, what we are as a, as a school system. Not, I'm not saying this for Haldane, but I think we would say we want to make sure this doesn't happen here. Uh, we want our students to be graduating uh, high school uh, with a sense of who they are, or a greater sense of who they are, uh, a, a greater sense of what their values are um, as individuals, and uh, potentially what they want to become. They don't have to have it all figured out. I think that's unrealistic by the time they leave high school. Uh, but I would think we would agree that uh, if you've spent 12 or 13 years in our school system, uh, or even just four years in our school system, if you just came for, for high school, uh, that we would want our students to have a better sense of these things uh, upon commencement. Tony Wagner, who's a prominent uh, author and researcher in education, uh, um, writes often about the change of how students can access information uh, these days, that uh, we no longer are an institution that has to dispense information. Students have, uh, our kids have access to that almost anywhere uh, they want to. Um, so there's no longer a competitive advantage to knowing more than the person next to you. The world doesn't care what you know. What the world cares about is what you can do with what you know. So I, I present these slides just as a basis for why we were entering into the coherence planning process this school year. 
So one of those uh, differences I want to point to, and I, I probably have not underscored this enough in the community groups that I've met with, uh, is the difference between traditional strategic planning and coherence planning. And something I you know, continue to realize, I think I knew, but it keeps coming up for me, is that as I meet with community groups, is that we have this, many of our community members have this frame of reference for what or how we went through the process in 2015 or 2014, 2015. And they're using that as the basis for what uh, their expectations are for what's occurring now and their different processes. And I've tried to highlight that um, as best I can, uh, but I'm realizing that we probably need to illustrate this in, in, in more detail as we continue to talk about the plan with various community groups. I shared this slide with the Board of Education uh, earlier this school year uh, that coherence planning is focused on the highest leverage improvement strategies that have demonstrated to have the largest influence on student learning and preparation for life learning and success in a digital age and I'll speak more to this in a, in a few moments. So uh, the last update I provided, I believe we were just getting ready to launch the Thought Exchange. That is now closed. Approximately 180 community members did participate in that first Thought Exchange. And the Coherence Planning Team is using the responses uh, to um, identify the uh, skills and attributes of a Haldane graduate. Uh, so we're working with that information now. Uh, and these were the, the various skills and attributes that rose to the top of that thought exchange. Critical thinking and problem solving, personal wellness, empathy and emotional intelligence, communication skills, mindset of a continuous learner, and resilience. So based on the, as we engaged the community and worked with this, uh, the information that the community had provided to us, this is what rose to the top. Now, I will say this is still in draft form. So I, I would not yet say uh, by any means this is finalized, but it's a good working draft. The coherence planning team meets again tomorrow. Uh, we meet again, I believe, two weeks from tomorrow. Uh, so there's still a lot of work that's going to be done over those next two sessions to continue to refine uh, these. And I do want to just come out of the presentation at this point for a moment to inform the board uh, that this is our, our district website. So in addition to this work that's going on uh, with the coherence planning process, I did want to point to that now we have a link on our website to all of this work. So there's a brief overview here where my letters to the community uh, are outlined. So uh, there was an initial letter at the beginning of the school year, one shortly thereafter as the co uh, thought exchange was launched. Uh, there was a letter I sent out yesterday as an update to the community on the thought exchange responses. The members of the coherence planning team are listed here. And this is a link to the responses from the thought exchange. And I thought that was important to point out. Now there's various reports we can pull from this. So. Uh, for sake of uh, brevity, uh, this is the first report that was provided, which are the 20 thoughts that received the highest star ratings. If you participated in the thought exchange, you'll, uh, you know that there was somewhat of a rating system that was included in that. So here's where you see the themes of critical thinking, collaboration, communication that really resonated with all of the participants uh, within the exchange. And the top 20 responses are here. If community members want more information, uh, uh, again, all they have to do is click on this hyperlink that's included here, and you can go ahead and access the entire exchange and see all of the responses, again, that were included with that. So again, in the spirit of uh, uh, transparency to a degree, we wanted to make sure that we're creating a section of the website uh, that as the process unfolds, community members can go back to and find information as it relates to the process. The previous information on the uh, plan that was developed in 2015 is archived right here. So you can easily click back into that and essentially it's the landing page that had been there for years with each of the goal areas uh, and the actions that had been taken as it relates to those goal areas. So those are all still there. Uh, we've just put them uh, secondary now to the coherence planning landing page. So I did just want to mention that as we were moving along here. Okay. So we're now looking as a team at the systems within the school district uh, to determine how we can better align our work to better meet those outcomes for our students or whatever those outcomes are finalized to be. And there's five key areas that we want to examine 
And this is the high leverage stuff. We want to examine as a system, how do we create goals for our students as it relates to those skills and attributes? How do we design instruction as a system to reach those outcomes for students? How do we measure whether or not we have reached those outcomes? What support, how do our supporting systems, our board of education, our administration, our community groups, PTA, school foundation, how do they um, function with those uh, qualities and attributes, or skills and attributes, excuse me, uh, in mind? And then what other factors in the local environment should we be considering in our planning? What are the opportunities that may exist within the community to help us reach our goals? What are the potential um, um, threats uh, in our community that we should take into consideration uh, as we're considering, uh, again, those skills and attributes that we're trying to ensure for all of our kids? Embedded within each of these is a matrix or essentially um, a rubric to evaluate our work in each of these areas. So the coherence team, again, is working with that. So as the plan comes to the board, you will see uh, our current evaluation of where we are, uh, along with action steps to guide us uh, the work that needs to be done to get us where we want to be. What we're trying to shift is, uh, this is not a very highly technical uh, drawing. Uh, <laughs> that being said, uh, we're trying to examine our organization, and instead of being an organization, you know, we have a finite amount of energy and it being pulled in many different directions to best align the energy expenditure in, in, in one clear direction, as best possible. It's not always possible, uh, but we want to kind of re-examine our, our um, system with this in mind. So this is an overview that I provided to you earlier in the school year, and we were really in this first phase uh, where we're committing to the principles of coherence planning. We're now in this second phase right now where we're doing the data scan. We're looking internally and externally, uh, again, at our systems, uh, and we'll be analyzing those results. That's what's happening between right now, tomorrow, uh, and uh, that first meeting we have in December, uh, and then we'll be moving towards focus setting. Everything is still in draft form, and I have to really uh, underscore that. Um, so I just want to state that because I wouldn't be surprised if I'm providing an update in January if there's been some shifts to the information that uh, I'm providing with you this evening. So in fairness to the, the teams uh, that have not yet <laughs> met again, um, you know, we have to see their work, and we have to provide feedback to one another and really uh, work with that. So... As far as what's next, uh, the 20th and the 9th, we're working on developing that draft. In January, we'll be seeking to engage the community again with a second thought exchange. Uh, and the purpose of that exchange will begin to provide feedback on the draft that has been constructed. So the coherence planning team, again, can work with some community, broader community input on the draft that they have developed. We still have a target of February for presenting the plan to the Board of Education for consideration. Um, I think we're on target for that. We'll know more over these next few weeks as to whether or not that's going to be realistic or we have to push that back to March. One other learning uh, through this is that between now, um, so November 19th or 20th, uh, in January, perhaps being more strategic with engaging various community groups uh, internally and externally about where we are in the planning process. If you recall, Jonathan had a date set up in October uh, to engage the community uh, in a forum uh, about the planning process. Unfortunately, uh, for both uh, his own and my own reasons, we had to cancel that date and reschedule for January. We still have that uh, date set in January. We'll still utilize it, but we don't want to wait until then. So the uh, building administrators and I have uh, talked about how we could each take a piece of this because uh, I have the full confidence that they've been along for this ride uh, just uh, uh, pretty closely here and uh, they could present this just as uh, well if not better than I could. Uh, but we have various groups internally that we meet with. We have various uh, community support groups that uh, we could each meet with um, and uh, talk about where we are in this process and what we envision this looking like uh, between now and January. So we're not waiting until that uh, draft plan is fully developed to, to engage some of our stakeholder groups. So we envision doing that between now and uh, January as a, as a small group. 
Okay, uh, so that's just, uh, I wanted to provide a brief update with where we are at this point. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. The small groups, Phil, are those gonna be, um, will the administrators be reaching out to people or will there be some sort of announcement where if people wanna be a part of that small group, they can raise their hand and Sure. Fine? Right now, we wanna make sure we cover the teams that we routinely meet with um, so there's uh, improvement teams at each of the buildings. Parents are part of that. We want to make sure we review the plan thus far or where we are with the plan thus far with those teams. Uh, I provided a brief overview to the PTA uh, earlier this week. Was it this week? Last week? Last week. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we might want to do an additional uh, PTA meeting. Uh, the school foundation, um, again, so our initial thought is those initial stakeholder groups. I think at that point, we'll see where we are. And then if we feel um, it, we have, it's a good time to, because I'm a little worried about the holidays here, and if we put something out there, will we get a good uh, response or turnout uh, of broadening that up? Um, and if we were to, that would probably be something I would take on. Um, I'm just trying, timing's important between Thanksgiving and the holidays, so I, I just want to be mindful of that. Uh, we do have the date in January. Again, we're trying to do our best to uh, hit our stakeholder groups as best possible prior to then, but we could always fall back on the date in January if we, um, uh, if we don't hit particular individuals who, who want to come in. It's also concert season, so those were some of the things that, or we're going to soon be into concert season. So those are some things we were considering as, as far as broadening it. The date in January, I didn't remember. You said we have a date set in January. We do. But I, 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 don't I didn't that. say it specifically. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I, uh, I could pull out my phone and look. No, uh, uh, just to, to make sure, because I don't think I know. Cause, like, like, we haven't announced it yet. Oh, so, okay, okay. Um, and I didn't. I could have listed it there. I just, no, that's I just, fine. Gonna, I just yeah. I'm not know. hiding it from anyone. No, I don't think you're hiding it. I want to make, sure <laughs> make sure I have it in sure. my calendar. Yeah. I have a quick question. Yep. Um, once we get, what, what are the components, what will be the, what's the outline of the plan once it's presented? What are the components in there? Once sure. So you'll see a section committed to each of these things. Uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> excuse me. You will see an analysis of how our current system uh -huh. aligns with eliciting what will be the final draft of the skills and attributes. And then you will see a recommendation for action steps as it relates to each one of these. Against each one of these. To Align create a better coherence. Okay. And you'll see a rubric rating. I think we're on a one through four scale. Of how well we... Four well is we're mastered, we're totally aligned, yeah. right, and working back from there. Is, does, um, do, you, do you assess each system against each... Skill and attribute. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, and how detailed do the recommend? How like how tactical are the recommendations going to get? Do you have a sense? Looking at other draft plans, I think they're pretty tactical. Okay. I think, uh, for example, at a at a board level and an administration level, we'll be pretty clear about whether or not we are planned for that and are doing it or not. Okay. Um, so I think they'll be at a level of specificity that uh, we'll need. Okay. Um, can I? Just jump uh, yeah, well, yeah, and point sure. to something. Yeah. Here's what we're trying to avoid, and it's not a critique, but I, as I was going through this today, and I realized, oh, yeah, yeah. see, I just want to like enlarge it with my hand, but I can't quite do that. <laughs> um, but I think I can read it. Uh, vertical articulation opportunities. So opportunities is passive, right? So when I when you say tactical, and I think specificity, we're trying to avoid passive uh, action recommendations there as we create be, this. Be, yep, yeah. it'll be definitive, and okay. we'll know if we did it or if we didn't. Okay, cool. I'm always interested that these kinds of endeavors, the goals that the, and I, I, I remember feeling this way a little bit after the strategic, the last strategic planning, is that the goals, they're very, I, I, I admire them and I embrace them, but. I'm always so interested that that academic rigor is never a part of the, you know, that that um, that, that that like hard academic outcomes aren't a part of them, and and I can imagine two things: one, that 
you all will take this and you will incorporate it into helping our students meet the, the appropriately ambitious educational goals that we have for, for students. So I, not, I'm not worried about it. But it also makes me wonder, like, do people feel like we're doing that good? Like, is that, is that something? People aren't worried that our kids, like, you know, can't write or can't, you know. I, anyway, it, it's, just sure. a, it's, just a, it's just a comment. Um, Can I respond yes, to that? Yes, I, I mean, absolutely. And I realize my, my entry into the district now was some time ago, but, <laughs> or at least it feels like some time ago. Um, I did not hear from our community members when I was coming in here concern okay. about our academic performance. Yeah. Um, I think, if anything, we're we're looking at that more internally than we're feeling it from uh, from external. Okay, all uh, right. But That's also, also that, that did come up amongst the committee as we're throwing up, you know, critical thinking. It's like, well, what about you know, reading and writing? Right. And Jonathan uh, Costa, the um, facilitator, did say um, it's not that we are we don't want our kids to read and write. You can, he said, you know, you can assume that there are some givens. And These are givens. Mm -hmm. Reading, writing, graduation mm -hmm. requirements, right. those are givens. What do we want as enhancements or, mm -hmm. you know, to um, develop processes to get to those or beyond those? And so he, he really leveled those as givens, which le allowed, I think, the group to not worry about writing up there, reading and writing, uh -huh. um, and to get a little bit broader in vision. Thanks. Okay. Actually, I will ask one more question. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, in 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 his and maybe you haven't had this conversation. I think it'd be interesting to understand when you get when you get to a draft of a plan. Do you think that most of the co the feedback and commentary from the community will be on the top line goals, skills, attributes, or w the assessment of how well we're doing currently to address? what were our stated future goals to that, or the tactics to get there? I believe it'll be uh, two and three. You'll so be you listed two, uh, two and three. Most of the feedback will be on two and three. Yeah, That's yeah, our current assessment, and whether or not our assessment as a planning team. Now, the planning teams would have gone out, for example, uh, if I was in the group goals for learning. Mm -hmm. Their job was to assess how we're doing this, so they weren't limited to just themselves right. uh, as a group of three or four they would have went out and spoke to other teachers, uh, maybe surveyed other teachers mm -hmm. uh, within the district to um, uh, determine how we're, to arrive at a conclusion for how we're doing in that area. Um, that being said, I think the variety, that the majority, and Jonathan would say this as well, of the community feedback will likely be driven towards their assessment and whether or not that's an accurate assessment of it or not. And that feedback will be provided back to the team um, to, you know, well, you think we're doing really well in this area, but we're hearing from our community, from our parents, for example, that we're not, or we talked about engaging students, or, you know, our students have indicated that uh, goals were unclear uh, for them through their experience uh, in the school system. Uh, so I believe the basis of the feedback we will hear will be about that, um, and then any accompanying, obviously, action steps are dependent upon that. Right, so. right, okay, well, thank you. Yep. Can I say one more thing to you? Go ahead, Mark. Yeah. I think the most important slide up there was the second one that said it's not what you're learning anymore because yeah. anybody can find any information. You can ask Alexa anything. Yeah. These kids are learning something completely different than we had to learn. So what they do with it is really those six things, and that's what's going to prepare them for the future. You know, we don't, the, looking at a book right now and learning all the history and all those facts, all those things that we spent hours and hours learning, it's a different world. Yeah. And all they have to do is ask Alexa, and they're done. And so they don't need that skill. They need all of those other skills to put this together. You're absolutely right. I was just listening to a podcast. Uh, Seth Godin is a prominent author, entrepreneur, and he was uh, speaking about how as he is working with students, he lives in the Hudson Valley area, interestingly, so he meets with high school students uh, uh, every now and then. He said, you know, what I see in the world, and this is a major business consultant, major business writer, uh, granted it's business-oriented work, but uh, what I see in the world is that, um, you know, the need for people who are able to solve really unique problems, 
Uh, like that's where the market is, that there's these really interesting problems that exist in the world and we need our students to have the skills uh, and the curiosity at which, in t uh, at which to enter into solving those problems. And in order to do that, uh, we need to give them unique and interesting problems to solve. Mm -hmm. And about that at a school setting, that's, that's really important. So, yeah. And I think we're getting at some of that in the skills and attributes that we're uh, arriving at as a community here. Thanks. I'm just going to click out of some of this because Leah is going to come up in a moment. Leah, I will leave the rest to you. I'm going to just kind of leave this here. Just one other update that I had. Uh, last school year, as we were uh, in the budget process, uh, I remember the meeting I was in. I don't remember who asked the question. It wasn't a board meeting. But someone had drew a conclusion or question with the retirement of a teacher aide who historically had worked at kindergarten, um, and a reduction of teacher aid support uh, that we were proposing in the budget, whether or not that meant we were reducing the teacher aid support in kindergarten, uh, that I believe the community has come to um, appreciate. I know our staff has come to appreciate as well at the kindergarten level. And the answer to that was an emphatic no. However, through uh, the summer months, uh, as we had some new students arrive, um, as well as some unique scheduling things that came up uh, through no one's fault, some of our aid support was diverted uh, from kindergarten to fulfill required aid support needs at other grade levels. Uh, as Ms. Jammin was coming aboard uh, in the summer months, not really, because uh, I certainly didn't tell her, uh, attuned to what the expectation would have been in kindergarten, we realized this as we got into the school year that um, the, the same level of support we had expressed would be there was not in place um, through those uh, at the beginning of the school year in, in kindergarten. Uh, Ms. Jammin has worked with her team to address uh, some of that. However, we do currently have a position um, posted. Uh, we'll be in the process of hiring for uh, to resolve that um, to, the, to the extent that we can right now. Um, and I just felt the responsibility, certainly talking with Jen, uh, to make mention of that to the board because whatever we're communicating through the budget process uh, last school year, you know, we have a responsibility to make sure it happens this school year. Um, you know, it should be a level of trust uh, that if I'm saying something won't change, that it's not going to change. Um, but there was, I think, in some transitions uh, this summer, through no one's fault, um, uh, what we were stating, what occurred, did not entirely occur uh, last school year. Oh, I'm sorry, at the start of this school year. What we will do is send a notice to all of our kindergarten families, uh, letting them know this is a level of support you should expect to be in place, uh, because historically it has been. Uh, here's why it wasn't um, up to this point in the school year, but here's what we're doing uh, to make sure that we get back to that and reestablish that level of support uh, moving forward. Um, just to acknowledge uh, that it happened, uh, but we're trying to make it right. Okay. So I did want to provide an update to the board on that. Mr. Sam, I'm assuming you're going to hit on fall sports when you do give your report. I have lots to share there, but I'll let you do it. Um, and lastly, just a quick pitch. I, got, I received my Arts Alliance newsletter again, and I know I did not entirely represent this accurately. If you're a member of the Arts Alliance, you get this newsletter, and you should. Uh, because there's lots of good information in here. Um, I love the profile of Ms. Stein, our band director. There's also some information on the tunnel project uh, that our DCI students uh, were a part of last, well, several years ago that has now come to fruition. And Dr. Silky, I have those pictures, so we'll come back to those perhaps during your report, if that's okay. You can give a little background on that. Um, so just a note that if you join the Arts Alliance, you get this great uh, newsletter once a quarter, um, and I really enjoy reading that. With that, this concludes my remarks. I'm going to transition now to Leah, and Leah is going to give an overview or a technology update uh, for the board at this time. So, Leah, bear with me, I think. I can pull up your... There it is. Look at that. Huh. I did it. Hey, hey. Yay, me. All right. I feel like I need to go into song here. <laughs> Would you like the... Uh... No, because I'm going to interact with it. Oh, got it. Right. Yeah. Interactive board. <laughs> We don't need this. <laughs> Only I need this. <laughs> um, 
okay, so I first wanted to int int introduce myself in case um, some of you do not know who I am. I haven't been up here in a while, it's been a couple years. So I am Leah Horn. I have been, I started my 19th year with the district, uh, which I find very hard to believe. I spent 14 years teaching. I taught um, life science and biology in the middle school and the high school. And about five years ago, I transitioned into a TOSA position, a teacher on special assignment. Uh, it's been an awesome whirlwind. We've uh, done a lot of work, and I'm going to share that with you. So been, this is the start of our fifth year with me in this position. So I went a little different with my presentation. Um, I wanted to take you more of on like a, a digital journey, a journey of where the tech department has started, where we are right now, where we're headed, uh, and some of the really fun things that are happening in the district. I wanted to showcase those. So I built a website, um, and in this website, I put all the fun things that I'm going to show you. The other reason why I did this is currently in seventh grade social studies in Mrs. Anisi's class, uh, one of the projects that we're working on is the students are doing digital journeys, learning journeys they're calling them, and uh, I spent some time in the classroom with them, teaching them how to use Google Sites, teaching them how to upload images, we're working on maybe podcasting next, it's kind of exciting. So this is like an example of what the kids built. Uh, they did a practice run, they just sort of did... Um, like the story of me initially, just to learn how to use the site and how to interact with it. So I thought, what better to kind of showcase what we did in the class. So um, basically what we wanted to do is start with the past. Where did we start? So I went back five years. I thought it was appropriate five years ago is when I started this position. It was appropriate that I started five years ago. And um, basically when I came into this position, I was a, <laughs> it's kind of crazy when you think about it, I was a life science, seventh grade life science teacher, and I uh, was kind of learning kind of flew by the seat of my pants and learned as much as I could that first year. Uh, I have since gone back to get my administrative degree because I thought it was appropriate to get that degree so I understand how to you know, manage budgets and leadership change and things like that, so it's been a great. But when five years ago when I took this position, some of the things that came to my attention was that our infrastructure was, was failing. It wasn't necessarily failing, but it was just uh, aging. The servers were aging. Some of the things that we needed were aging. And it really wasn't designed to support the technology that we wanted in the classroom. We were one-to-one -one iPads back then, if you remember. The high school was one-to-one -one iPads. And uh, so when I started, we had Edutech once a week. Uh, initially, they were two, week, two days a week. When I came into this position, we knocked them down to one day a week, if you remember. So they were once a week. And then we had myself and we had two technology coordinators. One was mainly middle school and elementary school. The other one was high school. And that's kind of how we functioned in the beginning. Well, what's... Leah, can you just explain yeah. uh, for audience members what or who is Edutech? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, I will. So Edutech is a uh, company that we hire, third party. They come in and they manage our IT. They do different levels of support. Our day-to-day -to, -day to support is like a level one network engineer. They come in and fix printers and software and password resets. Uh, TVs, touchscreen TVs, if we're having problems with them. And then we have some level three support. So um, about twice a month, we get a level three engineer who comes in. And he manages some of the higher level stuff, like the firewall, um, some of the uh, cybersecurity stuff that I'm going to talk about. They do some of that higher level stuff. So they come in um, and manage the IT, because I am obviously not an IT specialist. <laughs> they, take, they take care of that. And just a quick question. Yeah. Could you clear, what was the difference between your role and the role of the tech coordinators? So when I came into this position five years ago, my initial, I was initially, my title is integrate, technology integration specialist. It was um, pretty much right, I was told to write my job description back then, right? We really wasn't sure. The, the current technology director had moved on to another district, and so I was kind of filling a role. So when I took over, I wound up being the technology director. I took over the budget, I took over the management, communication with the staff, moving in, things like that. So my role right now is mainly technology director. I'm doing that piece. Those guys, the tech coordinators, were, we only had Edutech one day a week. So if someone had a printer that wasn't working and I couldn't fix it, I had the best of my ability, I'd run in and see if I could fix it, or if I was too busy and couldn't get there, that um, the two coordinators would come up and kind of see if they could troubleshoot it. Often they could, they'd be able to fix it and we'd be good. If they couldn't fix it, the staff members would have to wait a week till Edutech came back in order to fix it. So they did, they did level one support basically, just basics, because they're not trained either. We kind of just taught them how to do the basic stuff. Okay, okay. so obviously with an infrastructure that's not robust and is kind of aging, we're going to have some bumps in the road and some challenges. And probably the most 
common challenge, I think the board for sure that has been around has remembered was Wi-Fi. You know, Wi-Fi was a big challenge. We didn't have enough, we, back in those days, we had access points zigzagged throughout the building. That was the design, because back then we thought that that was appropriate. Today, access points are in every single classroom and every single office space. Each access point can handle up to like 100 devices. So that way, if students, especially in the high school, do have a device on them as well as a Chromebook, it's gonna, not going to get bogged down. So we struggled with that. We ser ser server outages. The servers, we lost power. It would take sometimes 24 to 48 hours to almost get those guys back up. They just were not sort of smart servers. And we didn't have battery backup. A lot of the battery backup, where we did have it, it was only three or four minutes, which is not even enough time to run up to the server closet and restart, you know, restart things. So it was a challenge. You know, I, there were days I came in on Sunday because I knew that the power was out because someone called me, and I would come in here to get these guys back up and running so that Monday morning the teachers wouldn't even notice that things were down. So and I didn't, you know, it was problematic. We didn't, ha we didn't know. And I'll, later in the presentation, I'll explain to you some of the awesome things that we put into place that make it so much a little bit more automated. Uh, software was outdated. We have pretty much updated every single piece of um, software. And I say software, I'm not talking about instructional software. Uh, it's mainly talking about things like transportation software, the lunch software, the video camera system, the proximity card software. When I really started to dig into these things, they were outdated. They hadn't been updated in years. Nobody was really sort of managing it and organizing it. So every single piece of software had to be upgraded. Someone had to learn how to use it. And then we had to get the new staff in there and train them and a lot of pieces of that. But it took us five years. We have one piece left, which is transportation, which I mentioned. Transportation needs an update. But um, you know, it's kind of nice to be able to say we, we updated all of those. OK. So, the infrastructure today is amazing. The servers that we have, all these awesome things that I'm going to talk to you about are amazing. And it's not because I had a magic wand, <laughs> I wish that I did. Um, I wasn't, you know, it was because of Smart School Bond Act and E-Rate. And by the way, most of this stuff, I built a lot of data into this site so that I don't, you know, I'm not going to dig into Smart School Bond Act to like really dig into it and E-Rate because I think it'll put everybody to sleep. But on this is links to, like if I click on this link, it actually brings you to the site and talks about it which probably I now can't reach to get back. <laughs> you want to do it, Phil? Went, no, Phil's got the mouse. I need, I need, yeah. Phil, you can be my mouse when I can't reach something. <laughs> That's embarrassing. So, <laughs> the story of my life. Um, so, Smart School Bond Act, for those of you who know state money, five years ago, they uh, allocated about approximately $150 per pupil and what that meant for Haldane is we were awarded about $248,000. If you remember, going back a couple of years ago, we had to submit a plan and design how we were going to spend it. And it was a process. We first got denied. I don't know if you remember the stories. We got denied for silly reasons, things like uh, back then we used a software called Let's Talk on the website. Do you remember when we were using Let's Talk? Mm -hmm. That they, 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 we put that because they wanted to ask, like, how are we communicating with our community? We wrote Let's Talk. They denied it because they thought we needed to talk about it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Ann and I, were, it was bizarre. So it was a little bit of a struggle, um, but we got through it. We, uh, at, to this date, we have spent $218,000. So we have about roughly uh, $30,000 left to spend. We basically ripped out the guts of the infrastructure. Our current infrastructure is like, uh, it's like Superman. It's got new servers. We've um, combined, we had a lot of physical servers back then. We combined them. We've got great backup. Our firewall is really robust. And there's a lot of really great things that we've been able to put into place because of Smart School Bond Act. E-rate is another piece, which I'm not going to totally dive into. This is federal money. And basically what E-rate means is we get reimbursed for anything that we purchase that falls into three categories. Internet, voice, which is actually they took that off. That's phone, but I don't think they do it anymore. And category two, which is our internal connections, which is our switches. The switches that are all throughout the building, they range about seven or $8,000 a switch. They're expensive. Um, so anytime we need to purchase one of those, we use E-Rate to get reimbursed for it. It's in its last year. This is the last year of E-Rate. So um, I think everybody's crossing their fingers that they'll reinstate it for the next. Now I can't back up. I didn't think I wouldn't be able to reach this. No, I got the pet. Oh, hold on. Almost there. OK, yeah, thank you. Sorry. So next time, so it's funny. I, of course, demoed this on a Sharp TV, but I did it down in the middle school where they're lower. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think high school level, so did I jump? Yes. Yeah. So anyway, so that's the basically just going back to our infrastructure, some of the things, some of the bumps in the road, the successes. Um, where are we today is the question. Oh, I didn't go into presentation mode. Did I not do that? Oh, I jumped, we jumped to the wrong tab. That's fine. Sorry. 
that's okay. This is what the back, background looks like. So the question is, what is happening today? So the amazing things about technology is how it's changed the classroom. The classroom is no longer those four classroom walls, right? The teacher is no longer the expert who has to know everything. You know, having had that many years in the classroom, remember those days when we had to have the answer to everything. And now technology has allowed us to open up the, door, you know, the doors, and uh, as we spoke before, that these kids have a lot to their, at their fingertips. So infrastructure today is much different. Uh, the Wi-Fi is amazing. I haven't heard any complaints about the Wi-Fi. A couple maybe uh, specific access points that are problematic and need some configuring, but the Wi-Fi has been really good. We put a new iMac lab into the library the last couple of years, so the library has an iMac lab that they use for Adobe Photoshop and things like that. We have gone one-to-one -one Chromebooks. So when I started here five years ago, um, there was not a single Chromebook in the campus. No Chromebooks. And uh, over the course of the last five years, we've built a Chromebook one is basically carts K3. K3 is sharing carts. Uh, grades four through eight are one-to-one. -one. High school, we just moved back, which I think everybody's aware of. High school was one-to-one. -one. We did some uh, surveys with the staff and trying to understand how we can best leverage the Chromebooks. So Highsbook is now um, doing carts, which I've heard a lot. Actually, I just had a student come down, a senior, came down today and was like, you know, Mrs. Horn, those carts are really awesome because I don't have to worry about dragging my device back and forth. Uh, and if I need it, I don't have to worry about charging it. It's here, it's in the classroom, it's charged. And it was good to hear that from him. So the carts, I think, are really working well. The teachers so far have reported that, so that's been nice. Um, oh, I wanted to also point out. So if we did have some students that did not have Chromebooks at home, they were able to reach out to us and get a Chromebook for us. So we have about, it's about 25 students that reached out to us who said, I really need a device at home, I have nothing at home to do work on. Those kids have devices and they're able to work at home, so it's been great. Um, the biggest, and I did this on purpose, I'm the biggest, Edutech is now five days a week today. And that's been humongous. It's been a humongous change in our ability to solve tickets and workflow. Back in the day when it took almost a week or two to solve tickets, today it's about 24 to 48 hours, if not less. Some of the teachers have reported they'll put it, we use a ticket system, obviously, so we can manage the tickets um, or manage the requests. The teacher will put a ticket in and the, usually Edutech is in there within the hour. Maybe while they're still doing the lesson in the middle of the problem, uh, they're able to, to solve it for them. So they, they feel that. Most of the staff have said that. It's amazing. It's, we get things fixed and we feel like we're supported. So it's been great um, having there every day. I wanted to share this. <laughs> Does anybody know what this is? So this is our current phone system. <laughs> I, I thought this would be a great way to visualize a current challenge that we're dealing with. <laughs> uh, I know Dr. Benante has mentioned that we sometimes get made fun of when we call other schools because they can tell that we're still analog. <laughs> you weren't supposed to share that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we're still analog. So one of the things that I'm very excited about is the voice over IP project that we're moving towards. This is funny. This reminds me of like some lady. I'm surprised there wasn't a lady in there with like a headset plugging things in and helping us move from extension to extension. But this is our current phone system. So our current, we still have challenges, obviously. Um, <laughs> that being one of them. Yeah. <laughs> that being one of them. Uh, obviously, even though with the Smart School Bond Act money, we were able to re-update and upgrade the infrastructure, um, we still have aging smart boards. So we have about 25 to 27 aging smart boards. We've been replacing the smart boards with these guys as they break. So as we start to see that they're ailing or starting to slow down, we, we fix them with, we replace them with these guys. So we still have 25 classrooms with old ones that are not as clear and not as, not as fun and snazzy as these guys are. So we're still working on that. Um, the other thing is obviously cybersecurity is a big piece. We're really focusing on trying to protect us and keep us up to date on everything that's going out there. We um, want to make sure our equipment stays current. It's an arms race, right? Trying to keep equipment current. The moment you get it in, it's, you know, it's aged and you need to upgrade it. And uh, our roles in the technology department are changing every year. We've, you know, everything is technology. The, the new Canon copiers, which I'll talk about in a minute too, uh, are amazing. The teachers have really enjoyed them. They're, uh, they're smart. They practically make cappuccinos when you walk up there. It's really fun. <laughs> but they are a new, they're a new hat. They're, they're computers. We've added computers that the IT department has to manage. So learning how to just kind of process and put processes into place and manage them. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is this piece here, which kind of mentions um, what we were saying. We know that a lot of really awesome work is happening in this district. And I, just for this presentation, you'll see I have some examples. I went out and kind of tapped some teachers on the shoulder and did some polling because I wanted to be able to showcase some work. And what I realized is we don't have a place to like a bucket to really 
put student work, to share it and showcase it and, and be excited about it and, and almost archive it. And that's kind of what I was excited about with this project. This, this digital journey could become an archive for uh, student work, right? You could go here to say, you know, 20, 2019 to 2020, what are some of the great projects that were uh, done in the classrooms? And you can look at it. And Because we have great stuff going on. We just sometimes don't know about it. And that's what I wanted to talk about with the success. We've got some amazing things happening. The um, access to Chromebooks and the help desk, desk tickets and our favorite copy machines, which we're excited. The other, uh, not that this is just as exciting, but we did submit a tech plan. So in November of 2018, we had to submit a tech plan to the state. Uh, when we submitted the tech plan, we chose the strategic, we chose our district strategic plan because that's what we had in place. We picked three goals. And uh, for each goal, you had to develop action plans. So on this, because this is a living document, if you click on that, that takes you to the website where our, it's currently on there so you can see what our tech plan is. Um, OK, so that is present. Any questions so far? Leah, yeah. you had up there that there's iPad clusters. Are they giving up on the iPads? I don't think you could ever get rid of the iPads. You really can't because of videos, uh, iMovies, apps, um, speech to text, the mobility of them. They're a little bit smarter than a Chromebook, right? It's a much more powerful device. The uh, Chromebooks have video cameras on them, but they're just not good enough to do like um, some documentaries and stuff like but that. But they're not one. They're not giving them out like they used to. No, no, they're not one to one. What we've been trying to do is get. They're in a lot of the, some of the the teachers have written grants for them through the foundation. Mm -hmm. um, so they're those classrooms have maybe five or six in the classroom. Their library has a couple. Um, there's a high school cluster up here that the social studies teacher has. Uh, the idea is to make them available. So like seventh grade social studies, for instance, it's doing this project, also wants to be able to document some video of their, you know, some of the work that they're doing. So they'll be able to borrow some iPads just for their project. Uh, it's there. What's exciting about that is they'll be there. Some of the problems we've had in the past is the iPads being shared. So my project's on the iPad, and then another student takes the iPad, and he's right. got access to my project. So these iPads will stay in Mrs. Anisi's room until the project's done. They'll be able to do everything with the movie, and then, it, then they can be cleared and moved on to the next uh, classroom. So I don't think we can get rid of them. We've talked about it all the time. They're, they're valuable in terms of their, uh, their smart and their, um, what they can do for the students in their, their classrooms. OK, so present. With that, I wanted to take you to, if I was tall enough to reach, OK, so I'm going to show you what's happening today in the classroom. <clears throat> you know, our Chromebooks are our new uh, textbooks. And we've got a lot of great things happening in the classroom. What I thought I would do is highlight, just quickly kind of highlight some of the s things that we did. So I, it's funny, of course, I did dry runs and showed some teachers us to help practice, because that's what we do, right? And they were so excited, like, what is that? And they wanted to learn all about it. And they're like, we can have access to it. But <laughs> there's some great things in here that our teachers currently use uh, to, for specific targeted learning outcomes that they use in their classrooms. And uh, I want to show you some examples. And then I thought I'd list, like, these are the specific tools that they have at their fingertips. So they could use a green screen. They do vScope, which is an app on the iPad. And they can do um, some green screen, screen work. The um, Ladybug document cameras, so we bought those for, to support Teachers College. The entire elementary has those cameras now. Every single classroom, K5, has those cameras. And we, uh, teachers love them. They're really snazzy and lightweight. We showed them at the tech committee uh, meeting yesterday. So, and what I thought I would do is show some examples of student work. So, this is um, just this is actually a really fun site. This was these were built with what's called Picto, Picto chart. It's just a quick example. It's a really fun um, website that helps the students build infographics, right? So a graphic that uh, teaches information. So this was just an example. They, they if you ever go on here, they have awesome templates that are really handy and helpful. So this was a class that built this to kind of do some um, some work in their classroom. I really wish I had thought about how short I was. <laughs> oh, I have the, where do you want me to go? I have it. Yeah, if you close PictoChart, that would be awesome. Got Thank it. you. This one is really fun, the Colonial Plant Garden. I think, I think most people are the most excited. So this was an elementary school classroom. What they did is they're, obviously their content here is Colonial Times. This is a photo that they chose. They had, there's a whole bunch of process of how they put, in, put everything in here. The kids had to go out to the garden, identify some plants, figure out what they were. But what's exciting is what they did is they built this interactive photo and they put their work in here. So in here is a picture of the plant that they had to identify. They drew pictures of it. Then they had to write uh, like a quick blurb about what it was and what it was used for. 
And it turns to, I looked at this and I was like, this is like a virtual field trip that they built. You know, they can kind of look in here and uh, put all their content in here. It's kind of exciting and showcase their work. All free, which is really nice too to have free stuff. These kids are good artists, by the way. <laughs> so this was one of the things I showed one of the teachers. They were like, this is the coolest thing ever. So um, some neat things going on here. If you could close this one, Phil. <laughs> So this, um, I shall be able to stop it. So this is an iMovie that was made, again, elementary class. I'm only going to play it like a minute of it, but it's adorable. I had to play it because his voice is adorable. Um, what they, before I play it, what else? They had to uh, figure out how much it would cost to go to a Taylor Swift concert. And they had to convert it from metric, you know, to English measurements to figure it out. Um, so he kind of does a whole visual. I'm going to just jump it. I'm jumping in ahead a little bit. Where'd my volume go? Volume. I tested this for, why are we not working? Oh, maybe I lowered it over here. I did, I lowered it over here, sorry. 95 meters to the second venue to the sun, this is 38,000 millimeters and 38 meters. Then the total, for the total, um, the total plastic <laughs> so cute. So they, this is an example. They used iMovie, and they used iPads. They had to do all the work ahead of time to get the content into the video. They had to edit it in iMovie, and then they had to put it together, tie it all together, and publish it. So it's kind of a neat little informational video that they made. You help me out here, Phil? Thank you. <laughs> okay, this is a fun one. This is um, so. Uh, there's something called the ITSD conference, which I'm going to talk about in, in a little bit, and um, these are the, probably the largest educational conferences in the, in the nation. And when we went to the ITSD conference, we've gone two years in a row now. The year before, it was in Chicago, and a bunch of teachers and myself went to Chicago. This past year, it was in Philadelphia, nice and local. We went just for the day. And one of the things that they learned about and like brought back was something called CoSpaces. And what this is, is a virtual reality software. And so these students built a choose-your-own-adventure um, with all the space facts that they needed to learn. So it, what's neat about it is you can manipulate it, um, click on guys, and decide where you're going to go. It's kind of cool. And they put a lot of time and effort. I think sometimes we've seen a couple of these. This was in um, Simon Dudar's class. So they use this. And I think um, the sixth grade one of the sixth grade classes has asked me for uh, some licensing because they got excited about this. They want to be able to use it. So they can kind of, you literally built this virtual world with the content built into it. So it's a, you know, it's an adventure as you, as you progress through it. Thank you. Um, last piece I just wanted to showcase was digital rubrics using Google Docs. Uh, this is an example of a document that's shared to students. They can collaborate on it. They can um, uh, respond to the teacher and it's just, you know, I, don't, I didn't want to overlook Google Docs and the Google Suite because there's a, a lot of amazing things in there for collaboration purposes. So this was an example. Of, this is what's given. This is shared to the students through Google Classroom, and they use this rubric. And they build. Uh, this specific teacher told me they actually build the rubrics themselves. They use a rubric designer and they build them themselves, so they really have some ownership over the rubric. Thank you very much. Okay. So our next step is future. So what I, you know, what I thought was important is to kind of talk about what are the skills and the standards that we're going to use like, for a housing graduate, right? What do we want a housing graduate to be able to do when they leave in terms of their technology skills? And in order to answer that question, I wanted to share with you like, some of the things that we use to guide us. I mentioned ITSTE, so the International Society for Technology Education. They have these amazing standards that are um, uh, they actually have six of them. I didn't put them all in here, but I thought it was most appropriate to have student teachers and educational leaders. And we certainly, it's, it's, got a, it's a lot of great things, as I mentioned, the conference. Um, they have a lot of courses for teachers. They have certifications for teachers. They have some really cool things on there. And then obviously the next step is to do the New York State technology standards. Now these current standards um, that I'm showcasing here are in draft form still, but I wanted you to be able to click on it and take a look at these guys. So this is in draft. I don't know why it's freaking out on me. Um, I just wanted to show you, sorry if I'm making you dizzy. Here. 
So this is an example of algorithms in a kindergarten, K2, 3, 5, 6, 8, 9, 12. And so in a kindergarten class, the task can be familiar, daily activity or more abstract. Algorithms at this, age, this stage may be short, containing at least three steps and focus on sequencing. So a lot of people are like, how could you possibly do algorithms in lower grades? And if you, as you read this, you obviously see that it goes up and up in its level of difficulty. And so this draft, if you go through it, has spatterings of this the content in each grade level. So you can see how we... Um, we can build curriculum, oh, it does not like two fingers, how you can build curriculum around that. So this is link is also on the website, so you can dig into that a little bit deeper. Thank you. Okay, so those are the New York State standards. Then obviously I wanted to link the coherence plan. It's still in draft form, it's still something that they're building, but it's gonna be an obvious piece of something that's gonna drive our technology curriculum and decisions we made and new technology that we bring on board has to align with this because we all need to be on the same page. Upcoming projects, I'm very excited, as <laughs> some of the things we're talking about is our new phone system. Uh, I'm excited about that project, because we've been talking about, I think we've been talking about voice over IP for about five years now, uh, you know, wishing for it. So it's exciting that that's gonna actually happen. Our security crimes are also gonna get a big refresh update. And we're constantly piloting new software and new ideas, which is kind of exciting. And then budget, I was asked to talk a little bit about what we spend. Um, what I have up here is basically in the past five years, looking at how much money, you know, every year we've got to buy new Chromebooks, new desktops, um, some pieces with the infrastructure in terms of servers and things like that, and professional development. The way that the purchases look is, you know, I, we buy approximately 150 Chromebooks every year, because what has to happen is you've got to obviously prepare for the ones that are aging out. Uh, so that we don't have an aged fleet of Chromebooks. Same thing with our desktops. When I got here in this position, um, I think it was like 70 or 80 percent of our desktops were old. We had old, we had desktops that were like 12 plus years old. I was impressed, by the way, that they were still functioning. <laughs> like, that's fairly impressive. So at this moment, there are 13 desktops on campus that are five years old. Those are our oldest desktops. Every other desktop has been updated. So a net has been, it helps make the network move smoother, and the teachers, I'm sure, are much happier because their computers are moving faster. Uh, the Aqua is the sharp board. So we've been purchasing about seven of them a year. I've been trying to uh, just, per, you know, it's a big, those are big ticket items, and it's a lot of process getting them mounted and make sure the staff are trained. So we, um, and like I said, we purchase them as we uh, see them breaking. Instructional software we purchase every year. The document cameras this year we put into it. And I just wanted to say that this, this does not include um, non-instructional software or support so software, so like the camera software, the transportation software, things like that's not included in there. And then these are our big insights. And so here's the deal, right? We had smart school bond deck money. We were able to refresh our infrastructure. The plan is we've got to have a plan moving forward because we can't wait 10 years and then have aging infrastructure. So the plan is to keep an eye on this and start in, you know, methodically purchasing and keeping these things up to date so that we have uh, the infrastructure stays strong. If you don't have these sort of guts and pieces strong and up to date and moving well, you're not going to be able to use the technology in the classroom. So that's important that we do that. And the IT support. Uh, I just wanted to share budget-wise with the changes and some of the things that they've been able to do. It's, we've had a lot of, I call them housekeeping issues, things that years ago we just sort of kicked the can down the road. Uh, these guys have been able to really dig into group policy and dig into some of these things, so it's been nice and ongoing professional development, training the staff. They've get, uh, we've had the trainers come on campus, they do it for free, they come and train us and things like this. So it's good stuff. Any questions? When you go to the voice over internet protocol, yes. is, what's that gonna do to the budget? The voice over IP, in terms of supporting that, most of it's coming out of, Dr. Bonatti can probably speak with that, but I know that the voice over IP system was in the bond referendum. So, uh, do you mean the support of it or the actual Both. installation? Well, and then afterwards, right? Don't we save a whole lot of money when we, when we go to that? Uh, generally, yes. For specifics, though, I would need to research that a bit more. Um, unless, Anne, you, you know off the top of your head. I do not know that. Right. I know so. that you will save money. You'll save the phone bill, so you won't have right? the same. Right, so all the phone bills will yeah. be gone. The mm -hmm. phone bills, the only thing that you have to keep is the, um, so like you need to keep the emergency lines. The pot, they're called uh, POTS lines. Mm -hmm. Plain, I had to think about what that meant. Plain old telephone lines. <laughs> you have to keep, I know, I had to think about that. <laughs> you have to keep that, the, the emergency, the elevators, the emergency phones in the, in the <coughs> di uh, district uh, main offices stay plain telephone lines. Because when, uh, here in Monroe, Monroe Bray had um, 
uh, some issues with, um, you know, like their network going down, your phones go down when you go voice over IP. So you have to right. build in backups with that. Right, but in the end, we're going to save a lot oh, of money. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Is, yeah. Leah, could you talk a little bit about what you believe, um, what percentage of your role is tech integration versus management administrative related responsibilities? And I guess, could you compare that to what it was four years ago or mm -hmm. five years ago? Because you spoke about when you started out. Yeah. Um, but if you could just speak to it. Yeah, the I would helpful. say that I still have probably 70% of my job is management. 70% of it is budget, ordering things, uh, managing the software, um, all of that sort of background stuff. You know, someone can't figure out power school, but whatever, I'm the one that's going right. to power school and working on that. With EduTech, what I've been able to do is, is St I used to try to fix everything, right? That's my personality. So I'd be underneath, de underneath desks and fixing printers and doing that stuff. So now I've been able to step back from the, that level one stuff and push into classrooms. So uh, example is the seventh grade um, social studies class. I spent two full days teaching a lesson with Mrs. Anisi, working with the kids. Then I made appointments for the kids to come to me. They were building their Google sites. They came to me during lunch and study hall. I made myself, I, was, I would never have been able to make myself available to support A, walk away from my desk for two full days and teach, and then B, uh, be available for kids to come and ask questions yeah. and help support them. I know we're only in the first or the end of the first quarter, really, of the of this year, and the level of edutech support um, that we have. There's been a level of onboarding that you've had to do. So, just looking out for the remainder of the school year, do you think if you said right now it's seventy thirty, mm -hmm. do you envision that sh shifting uh, a little more, or would you say no? It's probably it it's probably gonna be. would say, and the only reason why I say that it would say that way is because the software that I'm managing and supporting those issues aren't going away. My learning plan in power school, they're, 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 de they're dense and, and there's, nobody else really has the time to dig into them and figure it out. So my learning plan, for those of you who don't know, does uh, professional development, it tracks teachers' professional development and it does our evalu evaluations. So it's got you know, uh, a lot of density built into it in terms of approval paths and things like that. So there are days that I spend a lot of time working on that. So at the moment, until those things become a little bit more independent or maybe there's uh, some more training so that other staff members could maybe take on that. Power school, anytime a parent can't get into the power school portal, I'm on the phone with those parents. I'm constantly on the phone with those parents, talking, walking them through it. This is how you log in. I have them come in. Sometimes I'm like, it's so confusing. I know you're over, you know, come in, meet with me. We'll sit down and get in. So I don't know. I don't know the answer to that yet. It's still, it's still. And if it's 70, 30 now, what was it four years ago? Four years ago, it was there was no tech integration. It was uh, maybe ten percent, five percent, because mm. again, my personality okay. is not to say no, mm. <laughs> but um, it's a lot more, and it's a, it's uh, you know I I have the time that I can put aside and, and meet with teachers, which is exciting. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? I, I have a question. It was it was actually a thank you. This is great. B is this publicly accessible? It, it can be. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think your was intention was to make it available yes. for the board. Yes. For the board, okay. uh, but um, well, no, obviously, I, I guess, could I like poke around through that yeah. at some point? Okay, fine, great, yeah. good. Um, what really was interesting to me was a the substantial work on the sort of the, the infrastructure, right? The, obviously, phenomenal work to get like the the infrastructure up to date. Um, lots of investment and lots of smart planning on it. And also, the two things that struck me, it's like the number of different software systems you have to keep your eye on yeah. is not just like making sure the Wi-Fi works. Right. It's everything else that runs the district that possibly has a software piece attached to it mm -hmm. falls under your purview. So that's mm -hmm. a lot that certainly I wasn't aware of and probably a lot of people. The interesting thing for me about the student work was that it's it's – how do you think about tech, yeah, how students are using technology? Because it appears, it feels, and I know there are many courses that are, that are not this, but it feels like the instances of students using technology today are primarily new ways to showcase and display information. So instead of typing a book report, you do it on Google Docs. Instead of doing a, a presentation in front of a class, you do a movie and you present it. And you have the the 
obviously the technology facility to be comfortable with learning the different software and tools. Um, the, the New York State, what was it, digital fluency standards, I think is really interesting for a separate section of knowledge. Sure. And like, how do you program a computer? How do you, like, how are you using technology and manipulating technology, not just using it as an alternative right. main to display information that you've learned and created in another way. And it may not be a question for you, it may be a question for you, it may be a question for the principals, but it's like, how do you see that going forward? How do we build students who are not only capable of presenting information digitally and technologically, but actually creating technology on their own? And I will turn to you. <laughs> I think it's a good question. I don't have the answer. <laughs> and, and maybe part of it's the curriculum work right. that you're doing. This uh, year. I think when we examine, uh, so Leah alluded to the standards, um, which speak to that at various yeah. points. Yeah. There's an engineering component, a computer science component, which reminds I'm reminded of with your question. We have a responsibility then to put our educators together to process what those standards are, what they mean, connect them with other educators potentially who are examining the same standards and determine how do we create an experience for our kids to demonstrate uh, progress towards those standards uh, in their experience here. And you saw a little bit of how it's set up and there was actually an example embedded in, there's examples embedded into that, uh, um, into that framework that you can look at. I think the kindergarten example alluded to Legos and using mm -hmm. Legos to design um, something of some sort versus a third grade problem, uh, seventh, uh, twelfth. So we need to, and those are just for uh, exemplary purposes. Um, um, so we have a responsibility to do that work. Um, and that's where the curriculum work comes into play. Um, so I don't have the answer, but I think the process is is where the answer lay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, I was thinking. So Peter, were you about to say something? Okay. So Pete, Peter, actually, and John were the first. When, when, so my son Peter, when he was in the tenth grade in the thirteen fourteen school year, which is only six years ago, they were the first class. Like, I, I think it's really important to put in, 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 in a context, like, what's happened. So six years ago, it was a big deal to introduce the one-to-one -to, -one to the 10th graders, and, and somewhat controversial um, for lots of different reasons. And at that point, really, what you had were these very, very old desktops in the schools. And not only that, and I, I think Pete would be okay with me saying this, but my son had really profound dysgraphia and really could not write. He was not allowed to use a computer in elementary school. Like it would have been such a big deal if he had been able to learn how to keyboard. And eventually there was some focus on helping him keyboard. But we've gone from like, I mean, he's barely, you know, it, in 10 years, we've gone from forbidding a child who absolutely could have benefited from having access to technology to really having so much tech, you know, so much technology. I mean, and I, I think, and as a person who thinks about ed tech all the time and is highly critical of it, you know, in a lot of different ways or crit critiquing of it, I think it's really important to put in a context, like how far the district, you know, has come. You know, at the same time, I think, and I, I know that you all are thinking about this, but while we've increased our technological capacity so much, even you know, Ms. Horn, who was hired officially as a technology integration specialist, has not been able to, to do that yet. And, um, uh, and I have every faith that, that you all are thinking about how to do it, but I think that's really the next place to go. I mean, these are some great examples of what I think individual teachers doing with Leah's support, probably collaborating with each other are doing, but it, it is a little bit, it, it is a bit piecemeal. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and thinking about how to integrate technology coherently, I really think is probably where we wanna go. But um, again, I mean, I got to see this presentation yesterday because I'm the board's liaison to the technology right. committee, but it really gave me, I mean, I sat there and I started to calculate like six yeah. years ago, that is, that is so much change on top of everything else to see 
what's in our classrooms yeah. now. And we, my, yeah. what I really wanted to showcase is that we don't really capture it. There's so much happening in each classroom mm -hmm. that it just because of the day-to-day the -day mm -hmm. busyness of teachers and just not really having a platform, mm -hmm. there's a lot of awesome things going on mm -hmm. there, teachers using it. And I think that um, that's, that's what they're learning. They're going to staff development, uh, they're going to conferences and workshops to learn how to use new technologies right. in their classes. Right. And I think we need to wait until the state, because the state, just recently, it's just a couple of years ago, really put in place, brought together this group to develop these technology and computational, you know, computer science standards. I mean, we definitely need to wait until they're um, established, but then to, I mean, on top of everything else, you know, sort of figure out coherently how to support students to meet those standards, which I'm, I have to say I'm not very familiar with. But anyway, it's, um, that was a lot. I also imagine there's a challenge with getting all of the teachers um, on board and interested in integrating technology. Well, I don't think right? you're there have are some that are more mm -hmm. drawn I, I to it than others. I'm just going to say, and I think you naturally have teachers with strengths in different in different things, and that's yeah. what's exciting about going from one classroom to the next is that there's a teacher that's strong in virtual reality and building that, and there's another teacher that's using text to speech and Google Docs and collaboration. So. Mm -hmm. It's different, dif just spatterings of different strengths, which is, I think, great, because the kids are getting exposed to all these different pieces of technology. Mm -hmm. So. Is programming a foreign language? No. Like in the high school? No. No, it's not. Is it? Are the people it should be, if you think about it. Talk about it. Oh, is yeah, it really? Not right. Right now. Okay. It is like another language. <laughs> it should be. Cool. I think computer scientists would tell you it shouldn't be. <laughs> I know some computer scientists would tell you it shouldn't be considered a separate language. Thank you very much. You're yeah, very thank welcome. You so much. Thanks thank for you, giving me the opportunity. I really Absolutely. enjoy it. Thank you. Showcase five years of your life. And so you are. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> right. So you kind of wanted to show this journey. It's, it's exciting. It's a portfolio. Yeah, it really is. Mm. Really and, and you'll send us a link. Like you could just send us all. It. Yeah. I know there's some talk about whether or not because there is. I think maybe some student stuff in there that yeah. maybe can't be made public. But I think the board would definitely. Um, there's yeah. some great resources in there. I'd like to see it. And even thinking about a way to to make it at some point be public. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Thank Thank you. You. Thanks, Leah. Thank you. Um, is there any communication from the public at this time? No. Okay, so we're going into information reports. Um, I think our student advisor is at play practice. Yes. So, um, he is not here to advise us. Um, but I will turn it over to Ms. Jamin, our elementary school principal. Good evening. So you have my um, my report. I'd like to highlight that our students just did their speeches and student council elections the day after our real election day. And so um, it was a real privilege to watch that process. The students got up. They gave speeches again in front of our three through five students. Um, and they are really good public speakers. Uh, I was very impressed. My own Apple Watch, you know, before things like this is yelling at me and telling me my heart rate should come down. And <laughs> they were up there with, you know, charisma and jokes. And we have some very, very talented students. So um, I wanted to let you know that our new student council officers for the elementary, are our president is uh, Plum Seavers. Our vice president is Ollie Sanders. Our treasurer is Elena Johansson, and our secretary is Christine Janjoulis, and then each three through five classroom has a class representative where they gave speeches in their classroom. So that was wonderful. Um, and for the elementary parents, you saw my newsletter, but uh, I had the very unfortunate job of having to do the announcements to the students who did not win. Um, and we pulled them aside to talk to them in the library and give them a courtesy of, you know, knowing before the school-wide announcement. And I must say that was as impressive as the uh, speeches in the auditorium because just the level of compassion between those that won and those that didn't and just seeing each other and um, understanding was also a uh, heartbreaking but really wonderful thing to see as their school leader, just that level of community and support for each other. So I had both 
really proud moments in that, but really hard moments as well. Uh, another thing to highlight is that um, we will be trialing a new dismissal plan next week. So uh, in September, we obviously changed the dismissal plan. Uh, we had a number of concerned uh, parents that came together as representatives for what the concerns were with the dismissal plan. We were able to brainstorm what might be some solutions that would both address the safety concerns that came out of the safety audit that was done last year, but also honor the community feelings that, um, that our community members were feeling a loss of with the new plan. Um, so we brainstormed some ideas on how we could change that. I brought their ideas to the administration and to our faculty. There were concerns from their part, so then we convened some more committees, um, discussed what snow removal and uh, other such factors would have on different locations for an outdoor dismissal. Um, and so it, the final plan um, will be sent out with some um, visuals so that parents are aware of where people are going on Thursday as I uh, finish that, but it was discussed with the parents that had come together and the faculty this week. And um, I think it honors both the safety and the community. I'm sure it will have some bumps as people adjust again, but I'm confident that we have gotten this far. We will get through the next steps and um, the fact that we're doing it on the short week gives us two times to try it, but then a little bit of a break if there are any tweaks or differences that might need to happen before we go full speed ahead. So that is that. Hopefully, this will be the last time we discuss <laughs> the elementary dismissal. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that day. Ah, thank you. All right, any questions? All right. Yeah, what is a school-wide hungry hippo contest like? <laughs> yeah. Really? So that was uh, our staff team yes. building, and uh, we did um, we did a uh, real life hungry hippo game, grade level to grade level. Uh, they had I stole all of um, Coach D's supplies from under the magical uh, balcony, so <laughs> teachers were on. I have a video. There is video. Oh, I've seen the video. I, I say there's video. I, it's I just easier to see it, than to I can I can send it to the board, but there are rolly carts and laundry <laughs> baskets and buckets Great and <laughs> balls and the kindergarten teachers, uh, along with Miss Dabrowski, one of our speech pathologists, were the ultimate winners of the Hungry Hippo game. Yeah, good, yeah. good. <laughs> okay, thank you. Dr. Sioki, our middle school principal. Good evening. So um, it was something that you said, Dr. Benante, struck me. You said, I think you were quoting the podcast that you were listening yes. to, and that education today is about solving interesting problems in the world. And I would have to say that did the, our Discover, Create, and Innovate classes capture that sentiment? The classes are totally student-driven, and the students think about something that they're passionate about or something that has struck them as a problem in in society, and they think about how they can have an impact, like a, an actual impact, not a hypothetical impact or a solution to a problem, but a, a, an actual impact in the world. And I bring this up because on the screen is the newly um, designed tunnel in Cold Spring. And in 1718, the students of Heidi Gessen's Discover, Create, and Innovate class saw the tunnel and the atmosphere in the tunnel as a local interesting problem that you know needed a that needed a solution and they started the process then meeting with the town board and getting approval and then doing all of the research into the types of paints because it's quite damp in there and you know in, in uh, referring with experts where they needed to and figuring out costs and all of the work that goes into that and two plus years later on 113 um, a group of students teachers parents community members painted the the tunnel and um, will we were invited to come to the town board on Tuesday the 26th for a celebration and it's just really exciting the design that you see is the original design from the students in 1718 um, some who, of whom were there and some of who weren't there and that 
also parallels real life. Sometimes when you start a project, you plant a seed and get a ball rolling that is going to come to fruition after you've moved on to the next project and it doesn't change the value of, of what you're doing. I think, I just think it's fantastic. So, um, I love to see what's coming next from our Discover, Create, and Innovate classes. So, thank, thank you. you Dr. Thank you, Dr. Julia Sniffen. So, um, for real, on the top of my paper, I wrote, before I was going to present, uh, interesting problems to solve. Um, so, <laughs> same exact thing uh, that I'm going to talk about. Mine's a little bit different. Are you guys all drinking um, the same water? I don't know, <laughs> but I, it's right here. Uh, I'm going to have to read a little bit tonight. Uh, I apologize for that. But uh, today, Ms. Jessica Pazano uh, came in to speak with a group of high school students on the Ukrainian, uh, Russian, and U.S. relations. Uh, so as we talk about complex problems uh, and interesting things to solve, um, I have to commend our over 30 students and six faculty members that were there today um, to kind of gain further insight into the Ukrainian relations with the U.S., um, it was incredibly well received. Uh, all the teachers that were up there were interested in getting more information. Um, Ms. Pisano lived in the USSR back in the 1990s, early 1990s. Um, so she's lived a lot of the history between the Ukraine and uh, the USSR, uh, Russia and Moscow. So um, I would just wanna thank her. She is a parent of a second grader. Uh, in our school district. So we look forward to having her and her expertise. She's currently a teacher down at the new school uh, down in Manhattan, uh, and she's published quite a few books on the topic. So thank you to that. Uh, I also just want to point out we have two teachers um, who have been selected uh, to present at the national conferences within their subject matters. So Ms. Ashley Linda will be presenting at the English conference on amplifying your voice and making space for teacher stories. Uh, and that was a lot of research that she did last year that she'll be presenting on. And Ms. Seidman will be presenting on uh, the interactive social studies resources that can be used to create a more dynamic classroom that she uses in her classroom here. So we're interested to get some feedback from them on how those presentations went. And finally, uh, it's November. So we had 12 students apply this year for early decision. Uh, which are binding decisions. So if they get into one of those 12 schools or those 12 different students, that's where they will be going. And then we had 78 early action applications go out. Obviously, one student may have applied to more than one school with a number of 78. Um, so I want to thank Ms. Kachin, who tonight I have requested gets to extend the leave for um, Ms. Mosco, uh, who's been doing the work to fill in for her. So thank you on that. Ms. Rounds. Hi, good evening. So tonight I really, I'll be brief, I just want to highlight one thing from my report, um, and that is the work that our integrated co-teaching um, pairs have been doing. Um, over the past two months or so, uh, our ICT, our newly paired ICT teachers, so um, as you know, we have classrooms that have a general ed teacher paired with a special educator, um, teaching students with uh, both students with disabilities and students without disabilities in the classrooms. Um, they've been working um, and receiving professional development uh, from Goldman Sora and Rutherford. Um, we have uh, worked with them in the past and GNR has been coming in providing um, coaches to our teachers. They're uh, educational consultants and uh, they've been working with the teachers um, observing co-teaching models in the classrooms, going into the classrooms, getting to know uh, what's going on in different lessons and how the teachers are using those models, and then having time to debrief with the co-teach pairs and time to plan with them um, to discuss differentiation, to discuss um, overcoming barriers to instruction, um, and to talk about the different ways that uh, the models can be used in the classrooms for ICT. Um, so far, I've gotten really great feedback, both from our coaches that are coming in and from the teachers who have been working with them. So we're going to continue this work into the winter, and we look forward to working with them. Thank you. This was Andrew's report. And Andrew's at the play, and the play 
is December 6th and 7th, and this is the last workshop before the play. So the play will be the Laramie Project. Uh, so hopefully you will all join us again on December 6th or December 7th. Mr. Solom. So, so good evening. Um, so the last time I came up here, I spoke about how we were wrapping up the fall season, and I couldn't <laughs> be more wrong uh, because we are still <laughs> finishing our fall season, which is a great thing. So I just want to highlight a couple things. Uh, this fall, our boys cross country team, our girls cross country team, our varsity volleyball team, and our varsity girls soccer team all won sectional championships uh, in their respective sports and classifications. In girls soccer and volleyball, we won re regional championships. Um, and this weekend, our volleyball team is playing up at States uh, in pool play, which means they're one of four teams less in Class D. If they win, they advance to Sunday to play for the state champions. So a lot of uh, great, exciting things going on. Um, but there's one thing not in the board report that I did want to mention. So Dr. Benante, when you were showing the slides on the coherence plan, there was one of the categories for our students was resiliency. And one of the reasons I come to work every day is I love the lessons that sports help teach our children. Um, and if you were at any of the recent games, seeing how resilient our student athletes are is phenomenal. Um, so I'll give you just two quick examples. Um, our girls soccer team over the weekend lost the heartbreaking game in overtimes on penalty kicks, two to one. Monday morning, they came into school, heads held high, starting their winter sports, just proud of their accomplishments. They didn't sulk, they're not you know, down. Um, and that, that shows how resilient that group of young student athletes is. Uh, and then last Friday night, our volleyball team uh, was down 2 nothing in a best of five, which means the first team to win three. Uh, and they could have easy, easily hung their heads, but we fought, we fought, we fought. And before you know it, we ended up coming out on top, three games to two, advancing. So, you know, sports help teach so many life lessons. Um, and just having our students go through those lessons and seeing them come out on top, whether we win or lose, uh, it makes me extremely proud as an athletic director as, and um, as an educator. So just want to share those things because sometimes those things are overlooked when those are really the most important things. So thank you. Okay. We're going into our consent agenda. Um, consent agenda minutes. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. These are the minutes from our November 5th meeting. Any uh, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Consent agenda. Thank you. Consent agenda financial. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Consent agenda personnel. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Um, some discussion, perhaps? Oh uh, uh, two discussion points. Uh, you'll recall during last year's budget process that the district had budgeted to hire our own uh, board certified behavior analyst. Uh, that was an area that we had uh, determined we were spending a lot of money in contracted services uh, for to support our students on campus that it, it made sense for us to have our own person um, as part of our uh, staff and um, We felt that not only would we address some level of student need, but we'd also be able to do some uh, better preventative work as well um, And I'm pleased to introduce you uh, to Miss Marie Segroy uh, Who's in the back here Marie? if you just give us a wave uh, who uh, you're getting ready to um, uh, Act upon uh, my recommendation uh, for Marie to be appointed as the person who will fill that role we're very uh, we've enjoyed getting to know Marie and are very encouraged by uh, the prospect of her working with us full time in the very near future. Uh, and second, I'd like to, as the board is aware, we've been engaged in a search for a new director of facilities. Uh, and just a few weeks ago, the board had the opportunity to meet um, our finalists uh, and the chosen or recommended candidates with us this, e this evening. That's Mr. Timothy Walsh. Uh, Tim's in the, uh, the back here. And um, just wanted to have extended comments uh, about Tim. Uh, Tim currently serves as the superintendent of buildings and grounds uh, uh, in the physical plan and operations uh, department at Westchester Community College. Uh, uh, and he has just a, a breadth of uh, a, a wealth of background experience uh, on facilities related matters that I think are going to be really um, an asset to our school district uh, and something that I think our community should be aware of. Um, 
Mr. Walsh is also a commander in the United States Coast Guard Reserve, and he remains on uh, active status with the reserves. Uh, and I think just through talking with him, there's a, a variety of uh, life experience through his experience with the Coast Guard Reserves that will serve him while here. Um, I, I hope that Haldane is nowhere near the challenge, <laughs> um, or the challenge does not present the challenges that he has uh, encountered in, in that work, but um, I think it speaks really well to his um, adaptability, his flexibility, and his leadership. Uh, Tim's also a graduate of the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy uh, with a degree in engineering. Uh, he received his master's degree in business administration uh, and an advanced certificate in executive leadership from Marist College. So we're very fortunate to have someone uh, of Tim's uh, stature with us uh, here um, at Haldane. So you will be acting upon his recommendation or my recommendation for Tim's appointment as well. And I think after the appointment, Tim may want to say hello. Fantastic. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yay, welcome. Congratulations. Go ahead, Tim. Tim, please come introduce yes. yourself <laughs> at the microphone. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, again, I'm Tim Walsh. I'm very pleased and I'd like to thank the board and Dr. Benante for uh, the appointment or having the faith in me to serve as the next director of facilities. Um, I'd also like to thank the folks that were on the uh, uh, the committees and the interview committees are very welcoming, very professional, so that was very nice to uh, feel that as I came through these uh, interview process. Um, a couple weeks, I'm very much looking forward to coming here and working at Haldane. I'm looking forward to working with everyone, serving the community, so um, thanks very much, and I think that's all. I have. Happy Thanksgiving, <laughs> I guess, too. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank We're you happy to have you. Thanks. Uh, going into new business, the approval of the CSE CPSC placement recommendations. Okay, the recommend, recommended action states be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education hereby approves the recommendations of the Committees on Special Education and Preschool Special Education as presented. We have a motion, please. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, this is uh, the next item is our budget calendar draft for 2020 to 21. Um, I'll turn it over to Ann or, or Dr. Benante if you'd like to speak to it. Go for it, Ann. Okay. This is, um, as you pointed out, the draft for our uh, upcoming budget season. It's really um, mirrors last year's budget calendar, which. Um, I think worked well and uh, it was new last year and I don't think that there were any problems that we encountered with it. So um, we developed the, the calendar, uh, you know, to, to present if there's anything different that you want before it's approved, then absolutely um, let me know. I just wanted to bring the board's attention. I think that um, we have the March 17th workshop meeting and then not another meeting technically until April 14th. So, uh, and stuck in a March 31st maybe meeting mm -hmm. because that, that's a whole month um, to go by technically during a um, very hot time mm -hmm. for the board and the budget. So um, we'll just be on watch for that. We'll, we'll be in discussion if we feel like we need another uh, meeting or not. Right. But Thank yeah. you to Julia for, for pointing that out. She <laughs> saw a big gap there and she said there it's might be gap. something we needed there. Yeah. So I have to thank her for helping me uh, get that calendar together. And that's together. because we're shifting our first meeting that month because of, because of spring break. And so we right. meet on the 14th and then on the 21st. Okay. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't want you to forget any part of it. <laughs> long, long weeks. Um, and we're not acting on this tonight, right? Is this just, this is just a draft for us mm -hmm. to discuss? Just yeah. for your review. Okay. Uh, any further questions? Okay, so I think you're getting the nod of it looks it looks fine to us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It'll Thank be on the next the next meeting. Uh, any communication from the public at this time? Uh, so, oh, so our next, ex our new, our, we have new additions to our board agenda. Very exciting. We've talked about this over the past uh, couple of meetings. So the next uh, item is board reflections. So um, that's not for any of us to diatribe about our personal thoughts, but more, <laughs> more that if anyone had anything they'd like to share um, about, you know, that is somehow related to board service. <laughs> um, things that they attended. Um, things that they would like to make the board aware of, uh, things like that. 
So are there any board reflections at this time? No, nothing. I got to, yeah, oh, sure. Yeah. I got to go to um, the middle school dance as a chaperone <laughs> for the karaoke room. Um, but I will say, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I will say it's actually very impressive of the number of kids who will just hop up and perform a song in front of their peers mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. like very little oh, I'm, gonna, I'm worried about this, I'm going to do this. Like, like, at, and, and students that I haven't seen performing in front, like taking a, a leadership role or stepping up and doing it, I think it's great. Mm -hmm. So lots of music I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> and lots of Broadway tunes, too. So it was like all That's over the map. Yeah. Only, only some that I had to edit for, for content. Right. <laughs> it was great. It was great. Well, I guess I will say that I yesterday, I mean, since we're sharing chaperoning, yeah. um, yesterday... I, um, I was a chaperone for the first grade field trip to Sharp Reservation. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the bus, I sat behind my son and his very dear best friend, right across from Annette Padala, right in front of Lauren Hawker and, and uh, Ms. Grenant, all wonderful human beings. And I saw, uh, you know, I saw my son telling jokes, telling stories, singing songs, um, just typical first grade behavior. We arrived, he got off the bus, walked in single file, sat at the benches, typical uh, first grade behavior. And I will say that two years ago, right around at this time, my son, um, he had, this was about the time he had been removed from maybe his second pre-K program because he was not displaying typical pre-K behavior. <laughs> um, and over the course of two years, he's really, um, with the great support of the Haldane community and, and the staff, really made incredible strides. Um, so it was a, it's very difficult to be a, a parent in that situation where you have to remain hands off and not intervene. You want to come in and say, no, 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 what can I do? And he's really gone from like a, a, a place of never to a place of like, not yet, which is extraordinary. So that's my board reflection. Nice, I like it. Mm -hmm. sure. um, Superintendent, do you have any final thoughts? Final that you'd like thoughts, to share I know it's so us? definitive. I feel like yeah, I'm supposed to say final. something grand. <laughs> it, it, it better be good. I have nothing grand if to say. It's not good. Don't I bother. will say that uh, last Friday I was I was driving out and I. Um, I saw Mr. Headland and I you know, rolled down the window. I said, hey, what are you up to? And he says, I'm going to chaperone the dance. And I said, ah, I'm going to the volleyball games. <laughs> but it, I, I'm just going to echo in many ways what Chris said. Um, our kids, uh, especially our student athletes who are competing over the last uh, few weeks, were incredibly, uh, were found themselves in incredibly stressful situations. And I think when you're under stress, um, there, it reveals your, your true character that there, there is no, it is a glimpse inside of what you were made up of. And it reflected for our, uh, for our runners, uh, for our, um, volleyball uh, team and for the student athletes who are involved in soccer, the very best of who they are. And in many ways, the very best of who we are as a school community. Um, it was so much fun. Um, I was sitting next to Chris, uh, at the volleyball match and, um, you know, the, the highs and the lows, uh, and you're living it with all of it. It was a great community turnout as well. Um, and it was fantastic and people were crying at the end of the game. Folks were hugging at the end of the game. Um, it was just, it, it was incredible, an incredible display by, by our, um, student athletes there. And, uh, again, in our other sports as well. So I just wanted to share that. Uh, and that concludes my remarks. I think we start at 8.30. We start 8.30 sharp Saturday yeah. morning. So a cup of coffee, and uh, <laughs> you can watch that stream. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, I'd like to make a motion for the board to convene into um, executive session to discuss the superintendent's mid-year evaluation. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We are not coming back. Thank you.